Okay, welcome to the uh, Friday seminar series in the uh, informatics department. Uh, for those of you who have not visited us before, we're delighted to have you present. Uh, Patrick is someone who really brings, I think, interest from across campus um, to us. Um, Patrick is a visiting professor of digital humanities at UCLA. You've been there a year and a half now? Yeah, yeah about a year and a half. Um, and he's also a professor of humanities and uh, information technology at U uh, Umeå University in Sweden, as well as being a former director of the humanities, um, uh, digital humanities lab there. Uh, some recent publications of his include um, Big Digital Humanities, Imagining a Meeting Place for the Humanities and the Digital. Um, I highly recommend this, uh, University of Michigan Press. Um, this is really a key issue for our day, I think, is how the humanities and the, um, and the social sciences and the information sciences are going to network together and work together. Uh, the How and Why of Middleware with Johanna Drucker um, at UCLA. Uh, one damn slide after another, PowerPoint at every occasion for speech. Um, many of us will resonate with the issue of far too much PowerPoint in the world. Um, and contemporary and future spaces in media studies and digital humanities. So Patrick comes to us with a really rich organizational theoretical background uh, for exploring his topic today, which is critiquing, imagining, and designing infrastructure in and through the humanities. Um, so may we just put our hands together and welcome Patrick. And make sure Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, and thank you for the invitation. And we even have double copies of PowerPoint here. We were talking about that <laughs> earlier in relation to infrastructure. Uh, a good thing about the system here is that you can actually have two sources and output them, so you get two separate images. Yeah. All systems with dual or several screens can't do that, so that's a good thing. But as you said, few people, or it's rarely being used <laughs> that way. And one reason is that PowerPoint is key <coughs> to one slide at a time on one uh, surface. Uh, you can duplicate it, uh, but that's about uh, it. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I come here uh, reasonably regularly, uh, mostly to visit with humanities, uh, the humanities side of this uh, campus. I'm really happy to be here, and to me, uh, this seems to be a, a, at least a fairly humanistic place, so it's not a a far uh, step. Uh, so, so I'm going to talk about humanities and infrastructure. Uh, I have a background, fairly extensive framing part, and I have to look at three uh, case, case studies briefly, and also talk about uh, models of infrastructure. This is an ac it's, it's, a, it's about the academy or academic infrastructure as well as civic infrastructure, uh, and, and some institutional work too, so I hope that will uh, be interesting uh, to you. So thinking about the humanities, um, it's not that we haven't, uh, that we've lacked an interest in infrastructure, which is evident from work in cultural history, history of technology, science technology studies, uh, etc. And members of this uh, department, uh, Jeff of course has been instrumental to building infrastructure studies as a field. And it's not that we haven't had any infrastructure because, um, think about the humanities, because what about the history of memory institutions, uh, libraries, uh, printing, the seminar room, the university, etc. It's more uh, right now that infrastructure is a topic which Susan Lee Starr once described as singularly unexciting in one of her seminal pieces, attracts increasingly more direct interest. So I think the point I mean, her point wasn't that infrastructure is not interesting, but it, at the surface, it can seem uh, uninteresting. I think uh, my, my sense now is that there's much more interest uh, than, than earlier, another scale and range of engagement. And there, there was, a, at, the, at the Science Technology Studies 4S conference this year, there was a panel on the limits of infrastructure, uh, which uh, asked why the concept is so productive and what the limitations might be. Someone said in the discussion earlier today over lunch to so infrastructure is sort of uh, everywhere and ev everything. Uh, and humanistic scholars who have often been resistant to infrastructure speak, you know, uh, and what might be regarded as technocratic or uh, neoliberal regimes 
engage increasingly in discussion of, uh, discussions about what, what infrastructure, humanistic infrastructure can be. And there are a couple of reasons for this, I think. One is that it's sort of being, humanists are being increasingly or increasingly interested in infrastructure as a critical concept. Uh, but more importantly, probably, or as important is that there is an uh, infrastructural, what I would call an infrastructural regime enacted by universities, funding agencies, and uh, policy makers. Uh, so uh, increasingly resources are being allocated uh, in relation to, to, to research uh, infrastructure. And this is a, a top-down movement, but there is also an interest in uh, but connected to that, there's an interest in sort of doing, uh, starting new institutions, doing humanistic work, creating conditions for scholarship in, in new ways, but also in, in, in old ways, so people see the opportunity. There's also, I think, an interest, a larger interest in making or critical making uh, in the humanities. And we were talking about this over lunch too a little bit. Uh, you know, there's Matt Ratto's work, for instance, in Toronto on critical making, sort of thinking about how interpretive and making processes uh, come come uh, together. And in the humanities too, I think, the uh, increased interest in in the so-called global uh, societal uh, challenges and the rise of areas like digital, environmental, medical, uh, humanities. And also in really interesting uh, intersectional <coughs> areas uh, such as gender, ethnic, queer, and uh, disability uh, studies. So historically, I mean, the, if we're talking about an infrastructure turn, it goes back to the 1980s for societal uh, infrastructure, I argue, and the late 1990s for what I call academic infrastructure. It's normally called research infrastructure or cyber, cyber infrastructure. And, but again, that doesn't mean that there wasn't any infrastructure uh, earlier. There is this book, uh, which is often cited, American Ruins, uh, from Choates and Walter's book from uh, the early 1980s. The subtitle is Dec the Decaying Infrastructure. That's a kind of sense of country falling apart, and we need to do something uh, about it. But the infrastructure, that subtitle wasn't there to start with. It was a different subtitle. So infrastructure wasn't. And if you look at the actual book, um, phrases that are used uh, are public facilities or public works, mostly. So it points to a gradu gradual shift to infrastructure as a kind of frame. So what I'm saying is that the infrastructure in certain uh, contexts have become a, a way of sort of framing uh, the world. It's a, it's a kind of way of thinking about, uh, about things. But that wasn't the case necessarily uh, earlier. And if you look at if you want to build a lab, which I did, uh, and you want uh, research funding for that, we applied, when we started, I, I applied for what was then called expensive equipment, the Swedish Research Council uh, funding. Uh, it was a total uh, failure, <laughs> partly because it was so, I mean, I tried to make an argument, we tried to make an argument for humanistically based infrastructure, and, but the model was so much uh, science lab. So, so it was difficult, I mean, it was a good exercise, but it was very difficult to, to make the argument. But that's not called uh, expensive equipment anymore in that way. It's subsumed under infrastructure, research infrastructure as a, as a, as a frame. So I'm saying that these shifts, they may seem just to, you know, to be about language, but they're, they're important in, in different ways. So in Europe, in particular in Europe, here to some degree in the university world, there is a uh, an infrastructural uh, regime that has significant influence on the allocation of resources for uh, higher education and for the structuring of uh, academic work. And in many ways, the humanities come to this late. Partly, I think, you know, it's partly the, you know, we can partly blame the humanities for ourselves, <coughs> but it's also because the model and the template is a science one, science technology uh, one. But as I said, there's more work going on now. But if you look at, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, strangely interested in policy documents of different kinds, these kinds of research policy documents. And there is an OECD report from two, 2008 on infrastructural road mapping, the kind of idea that you, because infrastructure is, is expensive, you have to have a plan for how to invest over time. And some bits are very expensive, so they'll, of course, exclude others, etc. 
Uh, and there are people who work on uh, infrastructural road mapping in various countries, and then there are these uh, reports about uh, this phenomenon. Uh, and it says there, because they're talking about risks of uh, road mapping, and it says that road mapping can fall victim to its own success when increasing numbers of scientific domains are included in large uh, interdisciplinary roadmaps, extending to the social and behavioral sciences, and even the humanities. <laughs> so, so the humanities is not sort of, uh, is peripheral uh, to, to research infrastructure. And this example too exemplifies, uh, again, the kind of infrastructural uh, regime, because for which road mapping, the idea that you, you have a road map of investments is a key uh, mechanism. So, but what I'm arguing here is that, you know, nevertheless, this is an opportunity for the humanities, and I just put a couple of uh, reasons up there uh, on the slide too. And I'm not saying that I think uh, the humanities are doing, you know, what it takes right now. On the contrary, I think, but I'm saying that there is, there is opportunity. Uh, so, because first of all, infrastructure turn, what I've just been talking about, and the shift to infrastructure. Uh, requires critical uh, attention. Christian Sandvig argues that uh, <coughs> infrastructure has come to replace other similarly vague terms like, like networks, uh, for instance. And we need to study infrastructure itself. Uh, and for the humanities, this is an opportunity to think about uh, what we want, who we are, and what we want to be. Uh, and also, infrastructure thinking can be a way of framing arguments or even rethinking disciplinary uh, areas. Uh, for instance, in media studies, Parks, uh, Lisa Parks and Nicole Storielski uh, see infrastructure studies as a way of moving away from focusing on screened content in media studies to analyzing the ways content moves through the world and how these movements influence the form uh, of the content. And finally, too, and this is something I'm, I'm thinking about uh, right now to uh, you know the humanist as you know being part of, of imagining and building both academic infrastructure which I've been talking about but also civic and societal uh, infrastructure and sort of drawing on our uh, critical and constructive um, sensibilities so so one of my key points is that uh, today is that and I'm talking about humanities now uh, that, that humanities aren't only a site of criticality and distanced analysis, but we need to be part of the imagining, planning, and building of the infrastructure. And this is my own interest because I've been uh, involved in, in building infrastructure and also looking at it uh, critically. Uh, and often, I've learned over time, to often the changes that matter, or some of the changes that matter, are fairly small. So it's, it's many small things that, that actually create uh, change. So to, to be a little bit more uh, concrete, I thought I'd give you uh, an example. So, uh, so I'm based at Information Studies at UCLA. So this is a <laughs> kind of drawing of uh, one of their spaces. Uh, if you've been there, you might recognize it. There's a reception desk there. So I was talking to one a senior colleague there uh, last week, and I suggested that we, we, we think uh, space uh, here. The way that uh, spatial configuration reinforces hierarchies <coughs> and how space also relate to you know the operation or what you want what's the, the core operation of the department. And in information studies and in the humanities we talk a lot about power uh, power structures. I mean this is I'm in a power position now. I you know in, in some ways I command this room. I mean, all these things, and it's a spatial thing too. I'm up front, I may not be on an elevated platform as it used to be, but I have the podium, I'm fairly safe here behind, uh, even <coughs> if I don't have Jeff's laptop <laughs> up there. So, so these things uh, matter. So I suggested that we let staff, who are uh, positioned here, and there are many staff, but many of them are positioned here, take the windowed uh, space the offices that are around here that uh, are occupied by, by faculty. And she said, actually, I can give her her response. You're not from here, are you? <laughs> was, the, was the response uh, to that uh, suggestion. But I want, wanted to use this as an example because it's partly an infrastructural one. And if we were to change the way that we uh, use space, I mean, of course, it's not just a 
by one person and it's not about the faculty thinking about what kind of space staff need, it needs to be a, a collaborative thing. So, um, you know, if you wanted to make an argument for this, a kind of infrastructural argument, you could talk about, uh, you know, function that staff obviously spend much more time, or not obviously, but they spend much more time at the department and they're also the kind of contact point for, for many. Might be an ideology uh, here too, as a department we're committed to to reinforcing hierarchies a little, as little as possible, even though we know that we're inside these uh, systems. We might have a vision uh, which is about uh, staff, faculty, collaboration being key to the success of the department. And we also realize that we'll increasingly be dependent on, on special staff and, and specialist staff, not least. And this might be an opportunity, finally, to free up space for other types of infrastructure if we do these kinds of changes including perhaps collaborative space and, and uh, display technology. So if we were to do this, and I'm trying to be hands-on here, uh, there are the number of uh, conditioning things or infrastructural properties that are important here, and I won't talk about this in, in great detail, of course, but you know, there are architectural templates. Uh, you know, the, the size of, of offices, the way we, we construct space. There are material constraints, like pillars and other things in the space. UCLA, in this case, has policies for space. There's a facilities management function. We think about faculty staff roles in certain ways. We separate different kinds of spaces. Uh, and there is a long range development plan for the university and the university has strategic priorities. And of course, there's a question of funding too. So let's say we're, let's say this is the department and we say, well, let's, let's <coughs> think about this. Let's go ahead and actually try to do this. What would we have to do? And, and again, I'll do this really uh, quick. So we would have to have a lot of dialogue. Uh, we would have to think about values. I mean, what, what, what's important to us as a group, and this is obviously about people, you know, we're doing vision work. We're thinking about how, um, what's the foundation? What's the ideas that are behind this? Uh, we would have to collaborate across the department and outside the department. And we think about what kind of technological intellectual, informational infrastructure we need, how we create digital physical presences, perhaps write up a concept description of this, uh, do a costing and initial implementation plan, and do fundraising and actually build this uh, thing and have evaluation. And then infrastructures don't really, uh, they're, they're not static, so once you've built it, uh, it will change and you have to adapt. People don't, this is something, one of the things I've learned that people don't uh, do what you expect them to do, uh, which is great. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's, what, uh, that's my present uh, position, <laughs> at least. Sometimes when you plan something very carefully and it's not, it doesn't work or it's not used that way, uh, you have to be humble and actually uh, change it uh, too. So I wanted to, this is a simple example, but I just wanted to, to provide some some grounding here, partly also because I think in the humanities uh, we tend to look elsewhere in our critical work on these issues. Perhaps it's looking at science or, or corporations or, or civic uh, society. It's useful to, to look at ourselves too. Uh, so this is the kind of space uh, I've been involved in, in building, uh, or one of them. This is the this is home lab at the University. So you get the sense here of, uh, this is a, obviously a kind of uh, collage. This is a fairly technology-rich, humanistic environment that's based on certain kinds of ideas about the, the space, and where we sort of try to step away from some of the, some of these kinds of templates to, so for instance, uh, this is actually a model uh, of a space we built later, a display studio, where we didn't do we didn't do a cave, we could have done a cave. We didn't do a single screen, very large stereo projection, which you could have done. This screen has stereo projection. We did a slanted screen thing, so as, as you can see here. So one made very large back projected 4K uh, stereo uh, screen, but also a, a top down or a, a tall screen on the side. So these two speak to each other. <laughs> they're, they're placed in at a certain angle. And, and the idea, for instance, being this is a, one of the scenarios we created early on. This is a this is Rome Reborn, which is a, a kind of uh, 3D uh, historical reconstruction of Rome, uh, in fairly high detail. It's one of those projects that never actually will be finished. But they're so on, on such a big scale. 
But these things you typically, as you, as you know, you typically, if you've been in a cave where you have screens around, you walk into them and you're inside our world and you're supposed to, it's like a demo almost. That's my, my personal <coughs> experience. That can be very useful. But, but so, so what we wanted to do here wasn't, we wanted to, to provide that experience to some degree, but also step out of it. So here, I mean, in this simulation on the right hand side, here's a kind of a critical annotation of the, of the of the world that's presented there. Uh, so, th so the idea that these two can can provide different kinds of, of perspectives. Uh, just to give you one example of, of what we built, um, and also some of you may know uh, Johanna Drucker and her work. She's at UCLA, fantastic scholar. She's very uh, intense in my <coughs> copy. We were talking about copies earlier. So one of the um, for one of the events because we have this space where there, uh, there are 11 screens around. We, and I had, we had recorded her beforehand. So her talk, we did on these 11 screens at the same time. Uh, and uh, as a kind of a, an installation, if you want. So it's part of trying these things out. We had the, um, we had the reception just afterwards to, to let people, um, people uh, recover. <laughs> <laughs> So infrastructure is <coughs> embedded, as uh, Jeff's work uh, points to, um, uh, among others, in other structures, technologies, and social uh, arrangements. So it's you know always uh, social and political. And if you're looking at this kind of, I've been looking at humanistic infrastructure uh, documents. Uh, so for instance, there's an American one, the American Council of Learning Societies, our cultural commonwealth, and there. In that, and, and two others have looked at too, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see that uh, these do not include any references, for instance, to, to gender or, or race, literally. Uh, and there are only two references to labor, and labor in a, in a, not in a labor condition kind of uh, way. So my argument is that not only does well, infrastructure speak, humanistic infrastructure speak lack those categories that are very central to humanities. So there is a kind of disconnect uh, here that I'm, I'm inter interested in. So, but not only does it lack inflection by such category, I'm talking about humanistic infrastructure speak, but also scholarly, I mean strong scholarly and educational arguments for infrastructure, why we should build this uh, infrastructure. So there is no or very little what I would call epistemic uh, inflection beyond very general and hyperbolic uh, statements. So there is this kind of separation uh, between the two uh, sides, so to speak, which doesn't ring uh, true to me. Uh, and partly there are several reasons for this. One is that this is a kind of framework and template that's very science and technology uh, based. But I think there is there is definitely there's a lot of work to be uh, done here, and and building infrastructure can't just be an engineering or a finance uh, sector uh, kind of work. I think we we need uh, different kinds of competences to be involved in the in the building. So I've been also uh, so as I said earlier, uh, humanities aren't only a site of. Uh, analysis or distance analysis, but also need to be part of the imagining and planning and building of the uh, infrastructure. And uh, so, so, in terms of thinking about humanities, I think we need to, to, to change, think about our modes of engagement, our roles, identity, etc. I mean, change everything, of course, but, but I think there is a space here for doing, for, for uh, experimenting and thinking and doing things differently. Um, so, one interest I have is the, uh, and this is uh, not quite as boring as infrastructure, uh, perhaps, but it's about uh, the way we talk about ourselves, language-wise. So I've just chosen three progressive humanities-oriented platforms or arguments, and, and looked at the, the language used to uh, express the, kind of what we do. As you see here, articulate, debate, think, discuss, consider, and, and this is great, it's all, it's all uh, important, and these are great platforms. But I'm thinking about other kinds of verbs too, which, you know, including these, I mean, build, make, change, design, implement, tweet, intervene, provoke, disrupt, etc. And I'm not saying, I'm not uh, 
suggesting that there is anything wrong with these at all, but that there is a, this is about how we express ourselves, and sometimes it seems like that when humanities build things, it's true up here, technology, it's for uh, enabling discussion rather than actually moving out into the world and being involved in, in the actual uh, change. So I asked uh, yesterday on Twitter too about, uh, so I'm collecting some verbs here from, from, from different, I like this sect too, it's a, it's a kind of active but analytical uh, verb uh, too. I think I'm going to do a, uh, like a corpus, I'm a corpus linguist, that's my background, a corpus linguistics uh, study of this later on, on the operative verbs of the, mm -hmm. of the, of the humanities. <laughs> And I think it's sometimes there's an understatement of the role we play too in that kind of vocabulary. So, uh, and uh, uh, I'll put this online later. I just wanted to list a few sources that, so this is where I'm, I'm going to, uh, as an opportunity here to bring together critical, constructive, and creative work, and also drawing on work that has uh, a fairly strong component of activist engagement. There is some really interesting work, and, uh, and this is more, this is newer stuff, there's lots from before too, but on feminist infrastructure, feminist visualization, Natalie Dierdemenko's work on environmental health, uh, Matt Rato's work on critical making, uh, etc. Uh, and to just quote from the first, uh, I think it's listed here, for Brown, Brown et al. They say that successful infrastructure has the capacity to, tra to transform the world in which we already exist. Deal humanities infrastructure can open up new visions of the world in which we live and invite contemplation of the different ways in which we might live and work in it. Jared Drake, who is in the archival sector, says, I want the field of archives to be critical, ethical, and responsible. I want us to challenge power and authority, not merely acquiesce to it. I want us to be transparent about the forces that shape our work and stop pretending that the colonialism and imperialism of American state don't greatly impact the operation of most archival repositories, etc. So, so th that kind of uh, work, I think, can, can be really useful when thinking about the kinds of infrastructure we're interested in, in building. There's also a new piece by um, Lindsay Poirier. She, on devious design, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, digital infrastructure challenges for uh, experimental ethnography, which I think some of you might be interested in, in uh, reading too. So she says that devious design is, is can be considered a strategy for engaging the limits that constrain the process of critically designing digital uh, systems. So such work, I mean, the kind of work I'm talking about uh, must operate on in, in different ways on multiple scales, etc. And it's not uh, necessarily a so full, fully blown social justice or civil rights uh, project, and I wouldn't, you know, pretend at all that it was. But at some level, it's all about what Angela Davis speaks about: using knowledge as a way to remake the world and make it a better, make it better for all its inhabitants. Which requires, she argues, having a critical posture <coughs> towards the world and also be critical towards the tools we use to effect uh, change. So looking at, sorry, I'm going to post this uh, uh, online through my Twitter account and on my, my website. So looking at this, I have a, I work in the mornings uh, in a coffee shop in, in LA and one of my, it's a great place and one of the friends I made there, Stephen, when he saw this, I showed him the collage, he said, <laughs> Now, where are the people of color? Was his first question. He didn't quite put it that way, but that was the question. And it's a good question. Uh, because, oh, and of course, there are all kinds of structures and reflections to these uh, places that invite and exclude. So we need to think very carefully and be reflective about our own platforms, too. You know, another thing I, I would, uh, as an outsider, <laughs> if I pretended to be an outsider, I would say this is a very visually oriented kind of infrastructure, lots of screens. Uh, and the other thing, it's also, if you come from the humanities side of things, it's also, it's also shiny, you know, <laughs> as a kind of, you know, as, you know, are they trying to replicate Google, you know, couldn't they do that? <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of inflection, as I call it, 
we see everywhere in relation to infrastructure. This is a Google image search for infrastructure. And what you see here is infrastructural, you know, you don't see individual cars and all roads, you see road structures, and ports, etc. And if you look at this, I mean, there are a few people here, but among the 100 uh, images I looked at, the first ones, uh, the, there were uh, there are 10, at that point, there were 10 with people in them, and two were hacks <laughs> only. <laughs> so, but if you look at them, that, this is what, what they look like. So they're white, blue collar men. Uh, so, so of course, and this is not surprising, you know, but it's still, you know, it's, it's says something about the, the again, the, the inflection of, of infrastructure. And of course, Google image search itself is an infrastructure with certain algorithms. And, you know, if we look at Donald Trump's uh, infrastructure vision from the presidential campaign, it's, it's, you know, this is an extreme example in some ways if you look at the full thing, <coughs> but, but certainly this isn't the, uh, there's lots of social and political and all kinds of problematic uh, parts uh, to this that are very clear when we look at this kind of, of, of text. I think I won't go into any uh, details. My, my argument here, one of my arguments is that while we would like to think that science, infrastructure, text and discourse is very far away, very different than Trump's uh, infrastructure vision. Uh, yes, that's true, uh, but the, they're closer than we might want to think. Uh, so, so this is the Swedish Research uh, Roadmap 2012, and this is an image, it's the, I think it's the only image, or one of the only <coughs> images inside the actual report. It shows the Europe European Spallation Source, uh, which is a massive European and Swedish infrastructural uh, project. And at the time of the publication of this guide, mm -hmm. there were no legally binding decision to build uh, ESS uh, even. So this is, uh, uh, there were many issues, including scientific ones, uh, etc. And you can see here, I mean, I think it's an interesting image. You see Denmark, so this is in Lund, south of Sweden. You see Denmark across. So it's kind of symbolic, you know, the, the contact with the continent, uh, the bridge, uh, etc. So the sun hovers prominently over the horizon and contributes to a sense of future and promise scientific and societal progress. And this kind of, as you can see, a kind of pastoral uh, landscape. And the beauty, I I'm saying that this is not an objective kind of description. Uh, the, the beauty of the scientific is also stressed in the ESS written uh, materials, which actually, and I think this is amazing, it actually includes reference, explicit references to the beauty of neutrons as <laughs> tools to explore the nano world. Willem McGrell has <coughs> written uh, uh, about this. So the image represents the challenges and dreams associated with something as large, political, and placed in the future as the European Spallation Source. And these dreams are political, social, and, and individual. Uh, so through adopting this kind of material into a national document of considerable import, uh, the Swedish Research Council demonstrates its engagement, certainly, but also complicity. Uh, in such political, uh, societal, and scientific uh, dream making. Chandra Mukherjee, in her work on um, Canal du Midi, um, says that infrastructure building can encapsulate dreams on dreams on dreams. I think that's a wi nice way of, of, uh, of putting it. So I'm just going to move forward here. Uh, my argument here is it's not, not only the visuals, but also if you look at the way the conditions for national infrastructure in Sweden, it's, it's, it's the kind of language used is very, it excludes the humanities in many ways. You know, you're supposed to have a plan for access, uh, which uh, is about having specified use of the infrastructure, access to collected data and presentation results. It doesn't work with, you know, the workflow of many of the humanists uh, I know. So these things, again, these things matter. So let me also very briefly just give you examples of infrastructures that are not, if you look at these documents and uh, uh, discussions about humanistic infrastructure, they're typically not listed. So this is, uh, anyone knows this, seen this building? Is it in, in Dublin? It's a long room hub at Trinity College in, in Dublin. It's a, kind, it's a humanistic infrastructure. It's an advanced uh, 
Art and Humanities Research Institute or, or Humanities uh, Center. And these things are structured, uh, so have certain predispositions, including the way they organize work. It's typically people coming on fellowships. Often lunches are, are obligatory. There are activities and programming and certain kinds of deliverables, often uh, monographs, and certain expectations to, to go uh, with this. To, uh, I don't have time to go into details. One really interesting thing, I think, is how this, this, the organization of the space actually seems to reflect the kind of idea uh, about the, the operation. So up here, uh, graduate student fellows, uh, which come from all over campus, have their space. The administration and the leadership, they're down here in an interior hallway. That, to me, that, that speaks. That's important. That's meaningful. Uh, so the kind of connection between uh, ideas and concepts and how we actually materially uh, uh, express and act uh, our institutions. Uh, it's also interesting to look at, I mean this is a side point really, but I've been interested in looking at another center of this kind at Stanford, uh, the Center for Advanced Study there, which th there was an, this is a dramatic story, so there's an arsonist that sets three fires to this place I don't know why, or if, if they ever found out, but there is this article in Science from almost 50 years ago, and here it's, tr it's clear how uh, you're not really supposed to come to this place to make data, but rather to, well, and certainly you shouldn't bring your, your rats with you if you're an experimental uh, scientist. And I just uh, saw this. Uh, this is a Swedish similar institute where they have started a program for uh, natural and medical science. Uh, and again, uh, you know, they say, so they're normally dealing with social science and humanities scholars, I think, and they say that the, there are no research laboratories at the Collegium, and of course they're close to Uppsala University, which has a lot, and there are extensive such facilities. So, so it, but however, it's envisaged, envisaged that such scholars while in residence will primarily use such facilities as resources for intellectual encounters and dialogues rather than build their own research. So you're not really supposed to use the facilities, the research facilities, to, to, as you would as a scientist. You're supposed to go there and talk to the people. I mean, that's fine, but there's a certain kind of uneasiness here which talks about how uh, these infrastructures have conditioning built into, built into them. See how to on time here. Uh, just briefly, also another example. Uh, uh, this is a, a web-based one. You may not have uh, had to do this, but if you apply for funding for uh, research uh, projects, in, in, uh, if you're an academic, you, you normally now use these kinds of platforms to doing that. So you re register yourself, data, and the uh, project, etc. I've been very interested in looking at some of these, uh, including a few in. Sweden, I mean the point is that this is an administrative system. You, you give information about who we are, the project, etc. Uh, so, so it has an administrative uh, function. At the same time, it's also a way to uh, articulate and express research. So if I'm going to present a research project, that's, a, that's not, an, it's not just an administrative thing. I'm actually expressing my, my research. And <coughs> This platform, which is uh, this is instructions in Sweden, in Swedish, for one funding agency, is a system that only accepts pure text, so ASCII, not even not even italics. And that's made me think about other kinds of uh, systems of this uh, sort, where you could imagine all kinds of you know film, multiple modalities, etc., which would make sense uh, because that's. That could be, we were talking about that over lunch, a way of actually also changing uh, practices. If a funding agency said that, well, it's perfectly okay to do an installation, to uh, send us a game or a film or whatever. Yeah, I have a few other. I also finish with this, I think. Um, another example of sort of everyday infrastructure. This is a fantastic uh, book. <laughs> by Margaret Mead and uh, most of Margaret Mead and also Paul Byers on, on conference and academic events. So this is the small, uh, so-called small uh, conference. Uh, and 
And they're also, I mean, th this is an example too, they're also infrastructural in, in different ways and they support the production, exchange and dissemination of knowledge, but also many other functions, you know, if you, if you're a, a, an early career scholar and you go to these conferences, you'll uh, know or you get to know that it's about socializing, about your supervising, connecting you uh, with others, all kinds of things that goes on, some of them uh, not so uh, nice uh, too, but it's about also building your own academic persona. And they are structured through uh, programming, the use of space, uh, and choices are made in terms of scholarly themes, reviewers and reviewer criteria, keynote speakers, attendance fees, and many other factors that include and exclude people and perspectives. And the very details of, of how a question and answer session works, for instance, or doesn't work, it is, is important and, and meaningful in this context, the way that the space is set up, the, the screens, uh, etc. So the question is, if we want to change things, uh, if we want to change uh, that kind of structure or, or infrastructure, we have to go from a, uh, an analytical, deconstructive uh, <coughs> modality to actually uh, making uh, changes and trying new things out. And I've been involved in organizing lots of, of events, uh, workshops, conferences, etc. There were small things that I think uh, matter. So one thing I did, Sort of was to stop introducing people with a bio. It's a super, you know, normally in this kind of content you'll have someone, and if you're a senior scholar like uh, Jeff, uh, there would be a very long one, you know, and it'll take five minutes. And then you have a beginning graduate student and it'll be very short. So one way of, I mean, the hierarchies are still there, but you you don't necessarily need to reinforce them. So, so I got rid of that and I said, well, you can look, I mean, it's not being, you have to be polite to people too, Sarah. But, you know, there's lots of information online, so you don't really uh, need uh, to do it. So that's one, one example. <coughs> I also, because I, I relocated from uh, Umeå to the Graduate Center in New York first, and then here, I, you know, I, I didn't have a lab to take with me. And the lab was a great place to do events. I mean, you saw some of the, the photos earlier. So this is from the Graduate Center. So thinking a little bit more about light, lightweight infrastructure and technology, uh, this is a great space in the, in the Graduate Center. And we worked a lot, and we did that in the lab too, but I started to use uh, these kinds of things, iPads of different sizes. This is a little bit bigger than the normal head. There is a smaller iPad Pro that's that's the right size, if, if that's at all relevant. But here you see a conversation, and you know, you don't really know how this will play out. So I, I got this thing, this arm or whatever, and I have a wireless uh, Bluetooth speaker, and we had the speaker, a remote speaker, and then uh, this uh, lady, an art historian, asked a question, and it was natural for me to, to walk up to her with, with it. And, and then this really interesting conversation happened between them, uh, like here. So it's, you know, it's, it's experimental. This is Jonathan Drucker, part of a uh, panel. And also, briefly, uh, another example, and here is uh, Jeff. Uh, another thing I've tried to do is to think about these kinds of events in terms of, of uh, them being uh, multivocal and dialogic. So one of the things we did with the seminar, and this was the first one, uh, which I think was really good, and, and, and that was an important part of this, was to not uh, allow people to use PowerPoint. <laughs> Possibly one slide, or one photo, or film. And actually have a conversation uh, like this for two hours. It's fairly intense. Uh, it worked out really, really well, um, I think. Also done, uh, experimented with, uh, this is another format called pair conversation, where you have two people, uh, one image or one medium each behind them. This is in the visualization portal in, at UCLA. And uh, five minutes each to start the conversation around the theme that both connect to, and then 15 minutes for, for, for discussion. Again, it's very simple, but it's worked out really well. And if you stack them, if you have a number of them, you'll see that some, discussions take off and others others don't. And if you're flexible with time, because normally in this context time is very important. I know I'm running out of time. Uh, I'm aware uh, very soon. 
so uh, you think you know, in space, you know, if you're really a senior, you, you, get a lot, you can get the keynote slots. You have 45 minutes and you're happy about that. You're not going to give that away. But it's worked out well with these because it's possible when it, if it doesn't take off or it takes off on a certain point, you can give more time to, to, to other things. Again, just, uh, just uh, small things. And we've tried in the lab and layer two a number of interventions and strategies in relation to to academic uh, events I mentioned, but we did that on a large scale too. I mean, disallowing PowerPoint. It's a, it's a, or slideware. If you think about it, at least if you do many presentations, it's really so critical uh, to, to, to doing that job of presenting. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, experiment uh, to do. Another thing is to reduce time for keynotes to give more time to junior scholars. Uh, sometimes you have to fight with funding agencies to actually get that through, but it's, it's, uh, it's possible. And also thinking very careful about uh, moderation as a, as a process. So I'm going to, I have more stuff here. But the, the only thing uh, I wanted to say, I don't need to talk about the, the models, is that the problem, I think, for the humanities coming to an infrastructure, one problem coming to this kind of infrastructural thinking is that this is the National Science Foundation description of infrastructure, and this is the report I mentioned earlier, which is humanistic infrastructure, is that it, it becomes a copy, a kind of copy. So we, humanists, require similar facilities, et cetera, et cetera, but only up to the point where the nature of the data begins to shape the nature of the tools. And, and I think this is a very problematic way of thinking about it because Many would argue that, that sh the tools get shaped by the de data very early in the, in the process. And, the, and also in, in the, yeah, let's do this system. So, so the, 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 the kind of main uh, paradigms uh, for humanistic infrastructure is looking at technology or infrastructure as tools. <coughs> this is just a few examples of, of that. Large European projects, which are about tool and access, and another model I've looked about uh, too is uh, thinking about humanities as public humanities or presentation uh, rather than uh, research. And this is a, an event we did in Stockholm a couple of weeks ago where uh, it was about data-driven uh, research. It's a term that the government started to use. And, uh, uh, it's not quite clear how it came about, but what we tried to do was to be brought in the best, some of the best researchers and really try to redefine what data-driven research uh, can be. So this is from the Rav Institute of Technology. And this is the final uh, slide. I won't, I think I've talked about most of this. This is about the infrastructure uh, building, uh, caring about embeddedness, complicity, agency, building around the intellectual question, the heartbeat, the DNA, the challenges. I think it's also a lot about uh, challenging uh, or changing infrastructural regimes, these kinds of the templates I've been talking about. I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to Natalie Terjemenko, whom I mentioned earlier, and she, she's actually doing real projects in the real world. And one of the things she finds, I think, is that the way that uh, these things are set up within cities, for instance, the way that uh, uh, your contracting is done, all of those things are barriers. And the way that the infrastructure is thought of as something big and expensive, so if you have a better solution that's cheaper, it might not be interesting because it doesn't you know, fit the, the, uh, the pattern. And this is about uh, imaginary world, work and, and packaging uh, too, which humanists uh, not always like uh, doing. And I think those the categories I talked about earlier to gender is power of the environment, etc., are, are important, and also being critical about infrastructure as a, as a, as a frame. Thank you. seems to be concerned with innovating in this space and generating new architectures to use and explore. Uh, what is your responsibility to translating previous architectures into new ones? So to making sure that like, the knowledge and the practices that were once practiced, mm -hmm. at least the valuable ones, are also translated into the new ones. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and space. I mean, space. I mean, I'm interested in in, in space uh, myself. It's not only about space, of course, but it's a, it's a use. It's useful because it's obviously uh, material uh, too. I want just wanted to find. Yeah, this. I didn't talk about this, but you know, after this experiment <laughs> that I talked about. I mean, there is also this is a kind of bottom up in a way because it's the department engaging in this change and perhaps doing it. But there's also the uh, possible institutional uptake. So let's say other departments were uh, interested, uh, you know, they might get help, we might talk to them. And eventually that might, in, in, a, in a better world, <laughs> I was going to say in a good world, uh, translate back to changing some of these things, the templates, the, you know, the, the policies, etc., and maybe transform the UC system as a whole. I don't think that's likely to happen, but it's a possibility. In, in the case of Humlab, uh, it was actually, I mean, this is a, this is a fairly rich, com, you know, Sweden is a rich country, com comprehensive school in the north of Sweden, so I'm still talking within the university, but this was actually taken up by the university board. I mean, these kinds of meeting places were taken up by the university board, so there was a, a, there was a large investment in building other, not copies at all, but, but uh, actually using <coughs> experience for, for, for those. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, that was great and had many, many comments, but um, actually building a little off your question, which I really liked, mm. I mean, as you were talking, I was thinking partly of Stuart Brand, <coughs> mm -hmm. learn, mm. you know, that it's yeah. not just about designing a space, no, not really. it's about r continual redesign mm. of the space. Mm. Yeah. I think that's part of what you were getting at too, is this, this you know, to some extent you were talking about the design <coughs> perspective, how do, how do we design mm. the space, how do we design this infrastructure. Um, but it's also about how do we change, how do we yeah, build up yeah, the processes yeah. of change. I mentioned that briefly, I mean, yeah. the, the fact that it doesn't play out the way <coughs> you, you plan it. I think I personally have gone from uh, being more space-centered or, or sort of architecturally centered than I, <coughs> uh, I was more of that earlier, so I realize much more now that it's, it's about lots of other things too. I mean, it's not that I wasn't uh, part of it early, it's just that I am I'm more strongly aware of it. And just very simple, I mean, if you, if you run something, or if you have something like a, a lab, I can't show, I don't have all those uh, photos here, but you, one thing you, you notice in the space, actually, you can all see, there's a corner here where we have the tall uh, bookcase and the table behind it. Mm -hmm. And one thing we noticed was that people didn't use it. You know, and, and but then we changed it. We talked to people, and we we, we ended up doing. I mean, that was a simple thing. We just lowered the book. We got another lower bookcase and other lights. You know, <laughs> on, on the material level. But sometimes it's more operational, uh, too, of course. Uh, and this space, uh, which is a large uh, one, the screens around. Uh, we, when we started to, we had. Um, international uh, visiting researchers and part of that program we also negotiated so we could have some art fellows, digital art fellows, and they, they really changed our way of thinking about this space because suddenly it became an installation space and there was all kinds of things going on here that I, uh, at first, you know, if you planned it carefully, it's almost like, you know, you, you, you um, it's strange when people, you know, Make it into something very different, but that was that's also the point of it, uh, yeah. of course. But that's totally, and I think Stuart Brand's uh, work is um, is great. I think you, I mean, as you can see in these images too. I mean, it's about people, and it's about the activities, about the projects, it's about the the, the program. You you create certain conditions through creating the space and and that programming, but then it's really. It's, it's very much emergent, yeah. I think. And then you have to be adapt. You have to adapt. Have to adapt. Yeah, yeah. And and have that as part of the calculation too, because it can be costly. <laughs> okay, going back to your point, uh, why people don't use some hmm? technology uh, that we should try to people adapt. Uh, for example, in this picture, I see all the whiteboards are analog. You cannot see the digital white. Digital whiteboards in this picture. Yeah. So is there a special? No, for not for, for not having whiteboards and digital whiteboards or. Yeah, like interactive whiteboards. Mm -hmm. No, we. I mean, some of these screens were and are uh, touchable, so they have. I mean, you can interact with them oh, okay. directly. But I think uh, 
you know, which, which changed that. But I mean, one obvious thing here is that